did so yeah so now you guys know how to make an ota uh, with high dc gain you also know how, know how the gain is going to vary with frequency so what is the point of making this ota why are we making to be used in negative feedback that's the whole idea so if we put this in negative feedback what might happen or let us say if we put any system in negative feedback what is something that can go wrong stability, stability. right so this is a first order system so if i put it in negative feedback will it be stable or unstable unstable stable i mean why always stable or sometimes it can become unstable why okay uh, it's not clear let's look at it okay let's see right so maybe i'll start now uh, let's look at stability in negative feedback so let me just get a typical negative feedback loop we have seen this 100 times i'm sure so here e of s is our uh, first order transfer function like this fine so what is the closed loop transfer function from v in to v out here yeah what is it e of s by 1 plus beta times e of s right so let's substitute things and see and first of all okay let us say i give this this is a closed loop system this is a closed loop transfer function if we were to say that the system is stable or not what would you look at pole should be where the poles of the system should be in left half of s plane right so that is the fundamental thing to guarantee that the system is stable right so let's uh, this is a closed loop transfer function we know what is a of s let's put in values and see what happens so we'll have a not by 1 plus s by p1 by 1 plus beta times one so this will be a not by 1 plus beta a not okay so i write it in a standard form where i separate out the dc gain like this times s by the pole what will be the pole now i basically taken this term out p1 into 1 plus uh, a not beta okay typically you write it in the standard form so that it's apparent that this is the dc gain this is the pole okay so what is the closed loop pole now where is the closed loop pole yeah uh, okay it's i will not write the minus it's it's known that it is this place so this is in left half plane or right half plane left half plane so stable or unstable will it be always stable yes i mean remember that a not i mean this is all positive numbers right as long as this is negative feedback a not is positive beta is positive and if p1 to start with was lying in the left half of s plane even in closed loop the closed loop pole will be in left half of s plane so there is no question of instability in a first order system right so that is uh, something that we should always remember first order systems are always stable right to be put it in circuit <coughs> yeah yeah okay that is true yeah yeah uh, his, his point is we have assumed that beta is a scalar if beta was indeed uh, beta of s or something then that's a problem but in tip most of the cases uh, beta is a constant fraction okay yeah that is correct cool okay so basically this is the closed loop pole this i'll approximate as uh, beta times a not times p1 One plus a not beta. I will approximate as a not beta, and write it. So let's make. Yeah, I can make this observation here. 
So I know that this is the closed loop transfer function. So what is the closed loop uh, bandwidth here? When you say closed uh, bandwidth, what do you understand? Do you understand bandwidth? Huh? What is bandwidth? Yeah, basically where the uh, whatever the magnitude drops by 3 dB, right? What frequency is it here? It's a first order system. Hmm? Yeah, same. I mean, first order system. The pole is the same as the bandwidth. Okay. Three dB bandwidth. No, let's not go to. I mean, this is basically three dB bandwidth. Right. That's all. This is a system. I mean, basically, this is some. I know. Uh, I'll call it H naught by one plus S by some P one. Let us say P one prime. So for this system, the three dB bandwidth is at P one prime. Right. That's all. Because at omega equal to P one, what happens to the magnitude of this? It becomes one by root two, and that's the three dB point. Okay. So yeah, so now we have uh, made the observation that first order systems are always stable. So that is something nice. So let me remark it here. So that is something nice with single stage OTAs. So we can typically they will be stable. I will put a star mark here because first order systems are always stable. But we kind of approximate our single stage OTAs as first order systems. So, in some cases, if you are not careful enough, it can so happen that the high frequency poles may not be at such high frequencies. So, they can come to a low frequency and it is no longer a first order system. But typically, this will uh, be stable. But what is one problem with uh, single stage OTA? Yeah, exactly right. So as he pointing out, if you recollect, let us say you make a single stage OTA, you put in lot of effort into this, and in all the single stage OTAs to increase the gain, what have we been doing? We are increasing the output resistance. So let us say you made an excellent OTA with infinite output resistance. So DC gain is infinity. Now let us say you go and connect a load resistance of one k. What happens? That's going to be dominated by 1k. All your hard work is gone to waste. So typically, this is not a good choice for driving resistive loads. I'll just write not great for resistive loads. So that's uh, the limitation with this. But for capacitive loads, it's a nice choice. So now. I mean, if things were all nice, single stage OTAs would have been perfect, right? But looks like uh, that is not good enough to drive a resistive load. So let's see what we can do. So we know how to design this guy, but I can't go and connect this to the resistor directly. So what can I do in between? Yeah, okay. A uh, logical thing to do is to try to put a buffer. That's also fine. But once again, how do you uh, realize a buffer? Ah, no, what I am saying is how will you implement the buffer? Common? Not common gate, what? Common? Common drain, source follower, right? And even for a source follower, if you remember, the gain depends on the load resistor. So if the load resistor is uh, reasonably small, the gain will not be equal to 1. Let's say you get 0 0.5, 0 0.6 or something, right? This. Huh? Ah, okay, let's come to that. So. The point is, uh, you had a large gain, but this will definitely work. But the uh, when you do this, the overall gain seems to have reduced. So is there something I can do instead of a buffer, so that the overall gain has not dropped? Yeah, I mean, the simplest thing is, instead of putting a buffer, I can put another amplifier here, right? So let's say I go and put another GM stage here. And connect it. Now, of course, the gain of this guy is going to be small. Even if it's let us say five or six, it is okay because you get bulk of the gain from this guy, right? Now, if you still find the overall gain is not enough, what you can do? I can keep adding stages like a train coach. 
right? That's all. And uh, here, this guy, if you see, this is taking in two inputs and giving one output. So how can you realize it? What are the possible candidates? Yeah, all the differential amplifiers that we have seen can be used, the phi transistor guy or uh, CAS codes. This takes a single input, single output. What is a good choice? A common source is good enough. Okay. So for all the later stages, you could use a common source. For this guy, use any kind of diff pair. And uh, bulk of the gain is coming from the first stage. And the last stage is there for only driving the load. <laughs> okay. So this will definitely work. But the issue is, each of these guys is a single stage OTA. We can approximate it as a first order system. With let us say only one capacitor here. But the moment you put them in cascade like this, it's no longer a first order system. See when you put it in negative feedback, what can happen? Unstable. It can become unstable. Right? So this is the motivation for multi-stage. So let's try to understand uh, stability in some detail. I'm sure again, this you would have seen in other courses, but uh, I'll brush up few things so that everyone is on the same page. So we already saw what happens with the first order system. So let me use the same result. This is the feedback here. Yeah. If we had the first order system like this, where this is A naught by S plus P1 and you put it in uh, negative feedback, the closed loop transfer function is P1, sorry, I let it like this, it is A of S, the 1 plus beta A of S, fine, this one, uh -huh. Correct, correct. I mean, basically, this uh, gate capacitance of this, we'll assume that typically is dominating compared to the other parasitics. Yeah, again, we'll come to all that later, but let's assume that we can still approximate as first order. But see, the point I'm making is even if it's not first order, in this case, it's definitely higher order. See, even here, if this capacitor is not large enough, then this overall thing is, it's going to be a much higher order system. It's definitely, it will become unstable. Yeah, if you want, you can put it, you'll see, right? Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah. I mean, if you want more gain, you can put more here. That's all. See, uh, two things are needed. This guy has to be need. Uh, I mean, this guy is required to provide the bulk gain. This guy is required to sacrifice its gain to drive the load. This is like a war strategy, right? This is the low level guys. This is the king. And he has people in between. That's all. Anyways. Yeah, so what I was getting at is, uh, this is fine. This is okay. Close to transfer function is this. So this I'll uh, rewrite it in this way. Fine. And here we know the closed loop uh, bandwidth was approximately beta times A0 into P1. We computed it. So here, what is uh, beta I of S? Have you? Loop gain, have you heard this term loop gain? How do you find loop gain here? What do I do to the input? Yeah, I'll, I mean, basically input is zero. It's a voltage, so we are shorting it, okay? And I'll break the loop somewhere. So here it's an ideal block. I don't have to worry, I can break anywhere. I inject some signal, some test, and then say what, and then see what comes back as the return signal. 
So what is the return signal? Minus beta, ah, minus beta times uh, A of S times the test signal. So the negative of this guy is defined as the loop gain, right? So I'll write it like this. Loop gain here is. This is all ideal block, right? See, in a block level thing, it's okay. There is no issues. When, right? you, used to break in like two tens, when you have you circuits, break yeah, when you have circuits, you have to take into account a lot of things. But in ideal blocks like this, it doesn't matter. This is from here to here, it's always A of S. Even if you break it, from here to here, it's A of S. It's all voltage control, voltage source assumptions. So it doesn't matter what is connected at the output or at the input. Right? We'll see how to do this in circuits later. But anyways, okay, so one thing I want to do with this. So now let us say I delete this. this is not right now. Right. So let me expand this. This is beta times A0 by 1 plus S by B1. Now let us say I sketch this guy. This is such of this. That is, I will sketch the magnitude of the loop gain versus frequency. How will it look like? At DC, what is the value? Beta A0. And once it encounters the pole P1, drops like this. Okay. So let's focus on this point. So I'll assume that this is the uh, 0 dB line. Will I write it? Yeah. In log scale, so this uh, points to the frequency where the loop gain has dropped to one. Right? I mean, uh, why is it relevant? Because logically speaking, see, uh, loop gain here decides the strength of the negative feedback you have. If the loop gain here is zero or very small, can you say anything about the feedback? There is literally no feedback. So it's a very weak feedback. And only if the loop gain is really large, there is significant or sufficient negative feedback. So that's why at least this point seems to be a logical point. So till this frequencies, we have sufficient negative feedback. Beyond this, the loop gain magnitude is less than one. It's very weak. Right? At least uh, logically, it makes sense. We'll see more significance of this later. This I'll denote it as omega u loop. That is the frequency where the loop gain magnitude has become unity. Okay. So this is the loop gain. At what frequency do you think it drops to unity? How do you say that? I mean, we don't know anything about. It. Yeah. How? I mean, from this, how can you say? You are saying something that you remember from some other place. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Than one. Ah, see, the from here, right? You see that you are trying interested in this frequency, and this is going to occur at a much higher frequency than P1. That is assuming A0 is very large. If it A0 is very small, I mean, this will be very close. If A0 is really large, which typically is the case, this is going to be at a much higher frequency than P1. So how can I approximate this transfer function as? I have one plus S by P1. S is Loosely speaking, much much greater than P1. How is it? So you are trying to take the magnitude of this equated to 1. Omega is beta A0 times P1. Okay. Right? That's all. So once again, you see that this is equal to the closed loop bandwidth also. And uh, this is basically your feedback factor. This is the DC gain. And this is your uh, dominant pole. So uh, this thing that the unity loop gain frequency being equal to the closed loop bandwidth, which in turn is equal to this, is valid only for a first order system. Okay. 
only for a first order system i can make this statement that the frequency at which the loop gain becomes unity is same as the uh, 3db bandwidth in closed loop and that is equal to the feedback factor times the dc gain times the first pole Yeah. So if you sketch the closed loop transfer function, it will look like this essentially. I mean, or one upon beta, wherever it is, right? So. Uh, so what is the reason uh, in the second order system, uh, both both linear loop and closed loop bandwidth are not not equal? What? Because we have not proved it. Yet. For first order system, it is definitely true. Hmm. For second order systems, it will not be true actually, right? Only if we can approximate the second order system as a first order system, then it will be true. We'll see. Uh, come to that later. But as of now, the only information we know is for a first order system, we can confidently make the statement. That's all. Okay. So then, just uh, one point. So let me write it. Omega u loop is beta a naught times p one. So let's look at our single stage OTS. What is the DC gain for all our single stage OTS? It's G M by some G naught. What is the pole dominant pole? It is some G naught by C L. So what is this equal to? So whatever OTS we had, the five transistor CAS code, the unity loop gain frequency is still the same. The reason is because when you try to increase the gain by putting CAS codes or whatever. What changed? The output resistance or the output conductance is what got changed. So this changed. DC gain increased. The pole frequency reduced. So they get cancelled. It doesn't depend on the uh, output resistance. It depends only on the short circuit transconductance and the output capacitance, right? So and in fact, if you try to sketch the loop gain. Then I'll sketch loop gain as a function of frequency. For a five transistor OTA, let us say the DC gain is reasonably small. I mean, uh, not very high. You get the first pole, and it drops. This is basically your omega u loop, beta g m by C L. So this is for the five transistor OTA. Now let us say I put a CAS code. How do you think the Loop gain will look like. DC gain is definitely high. The unity loop gain frequency is also same. So it will basically follow the same line. Okay, and once it reaches its dominant pole, so if I keep doing this uh, thing, finally what will happen? Basically, if I keep reducing the output resistance. Ideally, you want G naught to be what? DC gain. You want it to be infinite, so G naught should be. Ah, I ideally, if I had to give zero, G naught to zero, then basically you will end up with a case like this. Right. So, what kind of a block has this kind of transfer function? Integrate. Okay. And I mean, you can see from. If I look here, right? Let me sketch it. So we have G M, G naught and C L. Ideally, you don't want G naught. So if I apply an input V I of S, what will be the transfer function? Yeah, let me write here of S. What is it? What is it? I mean, G naught is not there. I apply V in. What is the current? G M V in, and that current will flow through which component? So, what is the output voltage? Okay, this will be the open loop transfer function, ideally. And as you see, this is basically an integrator. So, bottom line, I mean, uh, single stage OTA. Ideally, you want it to behave like an integrator. With a capacitive load. Okay. 
and one other thing so let us say here i uh, let us say i put omega equal to gm by cl what happens to the magnitude of gain i put s is j omega and omega is gm by cl what happens to the gain one okay so we'll call uh, this gm by cl as the unity gain frequency for the amplifier itself so this is basically the unity gain frequency for the ot or we'll often call it as ugb also yeah so if you take uh, an ota which has a unity gain uh, frequency of gm by cl put it in a negative feedback with a feedback factor of beta the unity loop gain frequency will be beta times the unity gain frequency of the amplifier itself i mean just a definition just to differentiate the two that's all right this is the uh, frequency at which the transfer function open loop transfer function becomes unity this is the frequency where the loop gain becomes unity and the loop gain can be beta times the open loop transfer function okay this minor thing just have it in mind yeah, yeah i mean there is no feedback i just taken open loop transfer function i am trying to find where it is going to unity see one is a of s omega u my loop gain is basically beta times a of s right that's all so this basically beta times omega u will be your unity loop gain frequency okay so bottom line for first order systems you know that they are always stable and the unity loop gain frequency will be same as your closed loop bandwidth this you can approximate as beta times the dc gain times the first pole you have okay cool so let's stop here and uh, we'll continue